The first way you'll develop as a PhD student is that you will become battle hardened. Now, very early on in my PhD and a lot of other PhD students just feel like the criticism is constant. Like there's bombardment of your ideas, your results, your analysis, the way you're presenting. It is just relentless criticism from the beginning of the day to the end of the day. And then that means that your very own internal criticism is also amplified and, and uh, uh, sort of turned up to the point where it just feels like you just can't do anything right. And then, by the end of your PhD, you are battled hardened to criticism. You are now also giving out this constructive criticism and you understand that it's coming from a place of wanting the person on the other end to do better, to get better, to, um, to kind of improve their results and their methodology and that it's not coming from a horrible place mainly. I am sure that there's some people that give criticism just to be mean, but largely a lot of people just want the science, the research, the outcomes to be better. It is all about making sure that you understand where the criticism is coming from, how you can take that criticism on board, improve your own process and understanding, and then move forward. That's what it's all about. And you're able to do that much easier at the end of a PhD because you've seen it all. You realize the world isn't gonna end. You realize that it doesn't affect you as a person. You realize that it is just part of the process and you carry on with your research, maybe adjusting a little bit to take on the criticism that's just been sort of thrown your way. This video is brought to you by my newsletter. Go check it out at andrewstapleton.com.au forward slash newsletter. The link is in the description. When you sign up, you'll get five emails over about two weeks. Everything from the tools I use, the podcasts I've been on, the perfect daily schedule, how to write the perfect abstract and more. It's exclusive content only available for free. So go sign up now. Boom. One of the biggest differences that I felt between the beginning of my PhD and the end of my PhD is you'll develop an appreciation for what being an expert really means. Now, when I first entered my PhD, I was, you know, too cocky, I think. I think I was just like, yeah, you know, I've got all of the top grades and I'm able to do this. And, you know, you kind of feel like, okay, you're at the beginning of becoming an expert and that cockiness, that, um, that sort of brashness really gets mellowed out as you fail and fail again. And then towards the end of your PhD, you realize what being an expert really feels like and it's nothing like you thought it would be. For example, you are now essentially an expert in failing in all of the different ways in a tiny field. You also understand what you know and what you don't know and also what you can pass comment on. One thing when you are entering a PhD, you know, I did such a broad sort of chemistry degree that I felt like, yeah, most chemistry topics I could have an opinion or, you know, I could uh, answer questions on. And then as you do a PhD, you focus in and you really understand where the limits of your knowledge lie. And you're quite happy actually to say, well, that's outside of, you know, my, uh, my zone of expertise or whatever. So, you know, I'm not really comfortable with that, but here's some ideas. Um, and being an expert really sort of feels inside, like you don't really know anything, but you just know more about what won't work than what will work. And that yes, within a very, very small zone, you can tell people what you know about that tiny bit of the world very confidently because you failed in all the ways. And so you're certain that this is the, tr the truth as we know it at the moment. And there's always that caveat on it. So yes, being an expert is nothing like I thought it would be. And I'm, you know, far from being an expert now in the solar field because I've not been in it for so long. But uh, yeah, that was one of the biggest things that really struck me is being an expert is not like it's portrayed in the movies. Another thing that really develops throughout a course of a PhD is the relationship with your supervisors. At the very beginning of a PhD, a supervisor is like this kind of uh, godlike figure that hovers over your research, tells you what to do, prompts you and pushes you in the right direction. And then as that kind of like relationship develops, it starts to become much more equal. And then ideally at the end of a PhD, you should know more about your topic, your specific research topic than your supervisor. And that is a strange kind of moment because 
you find yourself correcting your supervisor, not in a horrible kind of brash, uh, like I know it all kind of way, but as part of an academic, robust academic discussion with someone who you used to consider like this amazing kind of mind, and they're still that amazing mind, but you've kind of slowly worked your way up towards them in a very specific field. And uh, you know, that is something that I, didn't really appreciate until after I'd left academia. Now, my relationship with my supervisor certainly wasn't the best um, throughout my PhD, but I took what I learned from that relationship onto my postdocs, and I felt like my postdoc relationships with the principal investigators and the supervisors I had in my research career after my PhD were, were so much better because I'd really learned about what an academic relationship really is, how it develops, how you kind of communicate effectively with someone who's kind of partly your boss, but also partly a peer. And uh, yeah, it is a very complicated kind of uh, relationship to balance, I think, but you certainly get much better at it. And then towards the end of your PhD, those discussions are so fulfilling because it really is two way street. It is less kind of like top down. And that is something that develops really nicely, I think. If you've got a good supervisor, that is. Some of them are just assholes the whole way through. <laughs> Throughout your PhD, you really learn how to show results and explain those results to people. Now, what I mean from this is like, you not only become an expert in Excel, but also how to best represent your data and your information so that you can highlight the things that are most important from a data set, from a table, from a schematic, like that skill is actually something that's quite hard and takes a long time to develop because you've got to kind of view your results as an outsider. And the way you do that is you have continuous sort of feedback and criticism about, well, what do you mean by this graph? And then so next time you show them something, you go, well, okay, it's this thing, I'll circle it or I'll make it obvious or I'll put it in a different color. And then you're like, well, I need to show that I'm not really sort of like, you know, certain on this, I'll put the error bars and all those little tiny things that go to representing data um, quickly and as effectively as possible, I think, does mean that you have to go through all of these iterations over many years, through many questions from people before you go, you know what, this is like how I can best represent the data I wanna show you. I had no idea how to represent it before. And then through all those years of feedback, you go, all right, this is it, this is the right way. Another thing that really develops throughout your PhD is your ability to scan academic papers. I remember in my master's and my bachelor's being given academic papers and not really understanding what they are, how to interpret them, and uh, you just slowly understand where the important parts of the information are hidden in a academic document, and then you have to kind of like work out how to scan. And I feel like I'm pretty good, and most PhD students in their final year are really good at scanning academic documents. They can go through peer-reviewed papers, review papers, theses, and go, you know what, I've written these and I know where to find the relevant information quickly. And uh, you can actually find out more about how to write the perfect abstract and stuff like that in my um, in my ebook, which is the Ultimate Academic Writing Toolkit. And I just go through the formulas that you can use to generate the perfect abstract, the perfect introduction. And, uh, you know, mostly people follow these, these uh, formulas for generating these sort of parts of their document. And once you get familiar with them, once you've written them, once you've scanned hundreds, if not thousands of these documents, it's just easy to get information, get the information you need from an academic document because you don't read it like, you know, a science textbook textbook going from the beginning, the first sentence to the last sentence, you jump around. And finding that information is something that becomes much easier after you've practiced it throughout an entire PhD. So there we have it. There are the things that really develop from the first to the final year of your PhD. Let me know in the comments what you would add. And also go check out academiainsider.com. That's where I've got my eBooks, the Ultimate Academic Writing Toolkit, as well as the PhD Survival Guide. And I'll see you in the next video.